Happy National Coming Out Day. I'm Kei Matsuda, a member of the JSA Board of Directors. And on behalf of the entire JSA organization, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the opening of the exhibit, Seeing and Unseen. Growing up in Japan in the 1960s and 70s, it was not easy for me to find my place in the society as a gay person. I looked and largely failed to find historical figures that I could uphold as my role models. That was because at that time, the history of LGBTQ persons in Japan was almost completely hidden, particularly regarding the period after 1868, when the country opened its door to Western thoughts and values. I moved to the United States in the early 1980s and some pioneering works on the queer history were becoming available then. I eagerly read books like Gay American History by Jonathan Katz, but trying to find references to gay Asian experiences in those books was like looking for a needle in a haystack. Times have changed. I'm happy that today's young LGBTQ persons have access to an exhibit like this and perhaps feel less isolated and less unsure of their self-worth. In closing, I would like to thank Amy Seiyoshi and Stan Yogi for organizing this exhibit. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our community partners for their support. Last but not least, I wish to thank all of you for being here. The world's best exhibit would not mean anything unless it is viewed and enjoyed by people and unless what they learn from it is shared with family and friends. So please spread the word. Welcome once again, and thank you. Okay, to celebrate the opening of the exhibit, Seen and Seen, Kanpai. 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 Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to the two of you. Um, while they're kind of getting situated, let me give a proper um, introduction. Amy Suyoshi is the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies with a joint faculty appointment at the rank of Professor in Race and Resistance Studies and Sexuality Studies at San Francisco State University. She holds a PhD in History from the University of California, Los Angeles, and a BA from Barnard College of Columbia University. She's authored two books, Queer Compulsions, Race, Nation, and Sexuality in the Intimate Life of Yone Noguchi and Discriminating Sex, White Leisure and the Making of the American Oriental. She's also served as founding co-curator of the GLBT History Museum, the first queer history museum in the United States, and also seated the Dragon Fruit Project, a community oral history project for API Equality in Northern California, queer a API advocacy group in San Francisco's Chinatown. Stan Yogi is co-author of the award-winning books, Wherever There's a Fight, How Runaway Slaves, Suffragists, Immigrants, Strikers, and Poets Shaped Civil Liberties in California, and also for Fred Korematsu Speaks Up. He's the co-editor of two books, Highway 99, A Literary Journey Through California's Great Central Valley, and Asian American Literature, an Annotated Bibliography. Um, Stan is co-chair of Okaeri, a group of LGBTQ plus identified Japanese Americans. With that, I'm going to hand that over to Stan and Amy. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Kay, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon and happy National Coming Out Day. Amy and I are going to take you on a very short tour of the exhibit in just a minute. But in the meantime, I hope you'll indulge me. I just want to acknowledge and thank several people. This was really a team effort, putting this exhibit together and planning the related programs. And there really wouldn't be any content for the exhibit if it wasn't for the research and scholarship of Amy Suyoshi, 
uh, Tina Takemoto, who's the Dean of Humanities and Sciences at the California College of the Arts. Andrew Leung, who's an assistant professor of English at UC Berkeley. And Greg Robinson, who's a professor of history at the University of Quebec at Montreal. So it's really their research that is the bulk of the content of this exhibit. And uh, without the talents of our designer, the exhibit would just be kind of facts and images. But when you look at the exhibit, if you haven't already seen it, I hope that you'll agree with me that because of our designer, Nalani Elias, it really is a work of art. And so I hope you enjoy it also as a visual uh, piece as well. And then finally, if we didn't have a host for the exhibit, then no one would see it. So I want to thank Jay Say and especially Jill Shiraki and Greg uh, Magofna, who's Jay Say's webmaster, for getting it up to share with the world. So Amy, I'm going to ask you to um, be ready to start our tour while I share my screen. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Can you? Oops. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, hopefully it'll be soon. There you go. Do you go back one slide, Stan, please? I'm trying to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you haven't seen the exhibit, this is the, the opening of it. Um, and so it's in sections. It's both chronological but also thematic. So Amy's going to walk us through the first section. Um, so first of all, I, I do want to also just thank Stan for um, uh, you know getting us all together for this exhibit. Um, I, I like to say that this exhibit was Stan's love child. Um, he's the one that really, um, his love for the API queer community is really what set this in motion. He applied for the CalHUM grant um, and he was able to successfully get it. So uh, thank you very much to, to Stan for corralling us as well. Um, so the, the exhibit is organized sort of broadly chronologically, but also um, in different themes. Uh, and this first section is really the turn of the century. Uh, it's titled Queer Traditions in a New World. Um, and it takes us through both Japanese and English language literature. Uh, and we actually, what we see is that both there were uh, Issei who we would probably call queer today in the 21st century, right? Um, and there was also quite a bit of literature written in Japanese in the Japanese American uh, press here in the US. Um, and one of the many arguments we make, but one of the arguments we make is that in fact, same-sex sexuality, as well as uh, sort of what they called gender impersonation back then was quite uh, prevalent and also accepted to some degree in the Japanese immigrant community, in the Issei community. Uh, it's not to say that same-sex sexuality and gender impersonation were embraced and, and totally lauded. Uh, that's not what we're saying necessarily, but it was actually common in the Japanese American press, common occurrence, and it wasn't necessarily written about pejoratively. Um, what we hope that you'll also take away from this section is that there were actually quite a few Nisei, uh, sorry, Issei, who were engaged in both same sex and also different sex intimacies, folks who you might call gay today or bi today, um, were very much running around um, during this time period. Um, and this, this sort of idea also comes from Andrew Leong, who talks about Issei literature as being both uh, queer as well as mixed. And Stan, do you want to take it away for the next slide? Sure, thank you. So the next section covers the uh, years between World War I and World War II, and it's uh, queer kinship in the interwar years. And during that roughly 25 year period, there was a shift that occurs from that more accepting kind of culture that Amy just described among the Issei to one that was more uh, heterosexually focused and increasingly more homophobic. So there was a move among Issei leaders in the early part of the 20th century to encourage other Issei to enter into heterosexual marriages and to have children. And consequently, there were Japanese American communities that emerged you know, throughout the West Coast and Hawaii. Uh, nevertheless, there were still some Issei writers, as Amy mentioned, who were writing about intense relationships between Issei men, and there were uh, some Issei uh, women and men 
who either defy gender, uh, increasingly strict gender roles, and maintain largely same gender uh, uh, social worlds. Uh, but as the Nisei came of age in the 30s, we see increasingly as represented in the Nisei press, the Japanese American press in English, uh, evidence of homophobia uh, entering into the Japanese American community. Then the next section covers World War II and it's called Queerness Under Duress. And as you can see from this introduction to the section that the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans not only reflected the US government's fear, racial fears of Japanese Americans, but they also wanted to control in the lives of Japanese Americans and their sexuality. But nevertheless, we have some uh, evidence in the exhibit of queer sensibilities and queer behavior. And you can see that when you visit the exhibit. So I'm gonna pass the baton back to Amy, who's gonna go over the next section. So this section called How They Saw Us is about representations of JAs uh, by non-JAs. Um, and this it's interesting because it's not necessarily all pejorative. Um, you'll notice that in a number of articles, uh, people talk about sort of uh, Japanese, Japanese culture. This is particularly at the turn of the century, 1890s to 1920, as something positive, right? So um, one is the, what the image that you'll see here, it's called Dramatic Art in Japan uh, from the Overland Monthly. Uh, what the author here, Dora Amston, is actually speaking about uh, how Japanese men are able to balance both femininity and masculinity to create what's considered the ideal man in America at the time. The turn of the century, uh, uh, Americans really believed that increasingly masculinity should be bisexual, meaning it should include both feminine and masculine attributes. So just a kind of tidbit to think about sort of, sort of how um, effeminacy or feminacy among men was not necessarily considered bad uh, in this earlier period. And then as we progress, we can see increasingly that uh, white Americans are articulating pejorative, homophobic depictions on uh, Japanese. And that's the, the second article here that you see on the slide that's juxtaposed with the first. Uh, this story of Taka here by Florence Estella Taft is likely the first depiction of uh, what we might call a gay Japanese person. Um, and you can see that also online. What we wanted to do was, in most cases, we wanted to try to upload as much of the original documents as possible. But because of um, shelter in place and COVID, many of the archives and libraries were closed. And so in some cases, we can only give you sort of a snippet of what we already had in our pockets um, or what we had in Andrew, Tina's and Greg's pockets as well as my pockets. So, we apologize that we can't give you the entire document, which is what we wanted to do, um, but you'll at least be able to see a snapshot uh, on the exhibit site. And Amy, you want to take us home with this last? Sure. So this slide is is one of my favorite. Um, this section, I'm, my apologies, is one of my favorite sections, um, and this is on the contemporary takes on queer J history. Um, and the reason why it's so moving to me is because. Usually, you know, for the longest time when I went through grad school and when I got my first job, history was considered super boring and people were not engaged in it. Um, uh, queer JAs, also queer Asian Americans, didn't really think of history as that significant. I mean, I would say in the past 15 years that there's been a resurgence of interest in, in queer history, particularly in the API queer community. Uh, and we see intergenerational interviews taking place, we see art. Uh, being formed around being inspired by queer Japanese American history. Um, we're also seeing a bunch of conferences form as well as oral history projects. And so these are some links and snippets to these other projects, contemporary projects on queer J history that are taking place. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing right now. And Amy and I are going to have a brief conversation about um, the exhibit, putting it together and uh, two of our favorite objects. So Amy, do you wanna sure. start with the question? So Stan, um, I'm always eager to hear and learn more about why you wanted to do the exhibit. I know you had brought the exhibit uh, to me uh, to say, hey, let's do this, Amy, but why were you interested in doing it? 
So there are a couple of motivations for me behind this exhibit. One is emotional and almost kind of spiritual, and the other one is a little more practical. So let me start with the emotional motivation. So as you know, I'm part of Okaidi, which is a group for LGBTQ identified Nikkei, our supportive family members and allies. And about four years ago, Okaidi organized a potluck for gay men over 40 who identify as Japanese Americans. And I participated in that. And we were lamenting that, A, we, most of us didn't know other gay men who are Japanese American. But we also lamented that we never knew any Nisei, let alone Issei, who identified as, as gay or lesbian or queer in today's language. And how we speculated how different our lives would have been if we had that example of somebody older who was living out and with integrity as part of the JA community. And it might have forestalled um, a lot of isolation and alienation that many of us felt uh, from the Japanese American community and in some cases from our own families. So a motivation for me was to try to uncover these queer JA ancestors, you know, our queer Jichans and Bachans, uh, um, so that current and future generations could benefit from that history and learn that, that there was a history of us being around, you know, from, from immigration on. Um, the more practical motivation is that uh, Okaidi has held biennial uh, in-person conferences, national conferences. And in preparation for our 2018 conference, one of the Okaidi organizing committee members, Marian Tsunabe, uh, organized a workshop with an uh, artist here in Los Angeles, Mike Saijo, to create these um, photographs. You can see them. This is me and my husband, David. So these were photographs of queer identified JAs, as well as our allies and family members. And these were gonna be displayed at the Okaidi 2018 National Conference. And in conversations with Marion and another Okaidi organizing committee member, Carrie Marita, we thought of this idea of like, not only displaying these photos, but having a larger exhibit on JA queer history. So that was uh, an impetus for moving forward with an actual exhibit. So Amy, you have done extensive research on queer JAs and specifically uh, during the, the period covered by this exhibit and even more specifically in the, the turn of the century. So in working on the exhibit, was anything new to you or particularly interesting in, in putting the exhibit together? Sure, um, if I could just briefly say also, if folks wanna ask questions, they're willing to ask their, their um, I think the chat box is available to ask questions. Um, I don't know if they should just direct their questions to Kathy. Is that the best thing to do? Uh, Jill or Kathy, if someone could respond. <laughs> um, so people can start typing in questions. It won't go to the group chat, but it'll go to the individual co-host. Um, to Kathy or Jill is fine. Thank okay, you. to Kathy or Jill, if, if you folks want to direct questions. Um, yeah. So. When I first started my uh, dissertation in uh, 1998, um, newspapers were not really uh, digitized as much as they are now. They had just started digitizing newspapers. Um, so I was actually going, uh, reading newspapers uh, page by page, week by week, uh, day by day, uh, month by month. Um, for, so I do, my area also is San Francisco and I was reading all the dailies in San Francisco um, every every single day, basically, for a period of 20 to 30 years. And that was a tremendous amount of work. Um, and, and you can only do so much of that before you start going crazy, because um, you're going through microfilm at the time. Uh, so you're like, it's this, you know, black and white thing that's in the library. It's hard to read. Um, it can and, make you nauseous, too. Like yeah, it can make you seasick, for sure. Um, and since then, a lot of the material has been uh, digitized. Um, and, and they digitized like the big newspapers first, like the San Francisco Chronicle, right? Um, and, and things like that. But now we actually have uh, Stanford University actually digitized all the Japanese American newspapers uh, in something called Hoji Shinpo. And you can actually go to the Stanford, the Hoover Library website and um, keyword search things like 
homosexuality or like nanshoku, which is the word for uh, uh, male male love or danshoku, which is another word for male male love. And all of these articles will pop up at, at your fingertips. Uh, Hoji Shinpo, I think they just started doing it, I think maybe just five years ago, it's very recent. Um, and at that time, you know, when I was doing my research for the dissertation, I didn't have, we didn't have the, the, the database available. Um, and, and so I wasn't able to do the research. And so part of what was fascinating for me was to be able to go in to the Japanese American press, dig through that database, just type in all the keywords that I learned from the turn of the century that are relevant to same-sex sexuality, as well as what we might call transgender identities today, um, but what they were called back then, uh, and look them up and they just all started popping up. Um, and it was it was pretty, pretty incredible. I think also I knew I had already done um, a, a keyword search for the Japanese press in Japan, like the Asahi Shimbun. I had looked up Nanshoku Danshoku for this earlier period. And so I, I knew that in Japan, they were already talking about it a little bit, uh, but I, I wasn't, I had no confirmation that, that folks were talking, that Issei were talking about it in the US. Um, and what was moving to me, and this is something that Andrew Leong already knows because he argues it uh, in his work, was that in fact, Issei were um, incredibly vocal, right? Um, and also talkative about same-sex sexuality and not necessarily negatively, uh, more in a matter of fact sort of way, and sometimes also with sympathy. Um, and that really goes against, I think, our Japanese American view that he say we're homophobic. Um, and, and it's something that I think in some ways we've swallowed and believed because America tells us that our immigrant communities are homophobic, right? So we just kind of believe that, um, you know, wholesale value. Not, not to say that, you know, we don't have difficulties with our immigrant parents, for some of us who have immigrant parents, right? Um, coming out is never easy, right? But it's important to know that that the ways in which we think about same-sex sexuality is also built, it's socially constructed by the beliefs of the time around same-sex sexuality as well as transgenderism. Dan, I'd like to ask you the question. Um, was there anything that you found interesting as you were putting together this exhibit? Yep, basically what you just described, Amy. So, you know, before Putting the exhibit together, I knew about your work on Yone Noguchi, and I knew about Tina Takamoto's research on Jiro Onuma and Issa Shimoda, who are Issei, who either defy gender roles or maintain largely same-sex social networks. Um, and also, I want to do a shout out to Ken Kaji, who I think is on this call. He did some research on Jiro Onuma as well. And then Greg Robinson had shared with me uh, some of his research on the English language Japanese American press, you know, in the 20s and 30s. But I had no idea about, you know, all this essay literature. And so like Andrew Leong has done such pioneering work because he's reading original sources and has uncovered these works by essay writers that depict what you described, Amy, in terms of the attitudes of essay towards um, same sex sexuality. So that was like blew my mind because you know, I used to do literary studies in Japanese American literature specifically, but I can't read Japanese. So you know, just knowing that these, these uh, stories and this literature exists was like mind blowing to me. And then secondly, what you uncovered, Amy, in terms of the Japanese language source materials from the um, turn of the century and early 20th century and how the attitudes were much more relaxed and accepting and, you know, Andrew, Leong um, is saying that you know, Issei leaders specifically made the shift in encouraging Issei to Issei men to get married and to have children, get married to women and have children, right? So there was like this sh conscious shift, right, in the community's attitude. So that was both enlightening to me and also to be frank, a little angering just to know that, wow, we had this history where, you know, we as queer people were more accepted and that shifted, you know, a hundred years ago. So that was kind of like the big you know, mind exploding thing for me. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen because we have some uh, visual aids for the next set of questions. Um, so let's see if I'm doing this correctly. So well, I, hopefully, oops. So can you see my screen now, 
No. It's still, it's still dark, but it, maybe it'll upload. Okay, oh, yeah, Zoom takes a little, little while. So can you see the slide of contemporary takes? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the question for Amy is, what was your, what is your favorite uh, image or artifact in the exhibit? And so my, my favorite image. Can you go to the next? Oh yeah, okay, thank you. So my favorite image is by far uh, this uh, portrait that Yone Noguchi, who is an Issei. Um, he came to the U.S. in the 1890s. He's actually the father of um, Isamu Noguchi, the Asian American artist who you probably all know very well. Uh, and this is uh, Yone's pick. And he basically, back in the day, like if you liked someone or you wanted to get to know someone, you wouldn't like exchange texts or Facebook or whatever it is you do now. You'd actually give someone a portrait of yourself and you would inscribe it. You'd put your little your name on it and a little message. And so this is a pic that Yone gave Charles Warren Stoddard, who was an older Western writer, considered San Francisco's first gay author. Um, and he wasn't, he was openly gay to all of his friends, but he wasn't openly gay to straight folks necessarily. But people knew that he was swishy. Um, he never got married. Um, and he wrote all these um, like books that had super, super homoerotic uh, innuendo. Um, and so, Charles would call, he was, he called himself dad. He made it, he thought of himself as, as a dad. He was an older guy. He was about 40 years older um, than Yone. And so Yone wrote this uh, portrait to Charles Warren Stoddard. And if you can see, it says to dad, and it's in quotation marks, Stoddard from Yone Noguchi. Um, so early on, uh, like when uh, there, there, when there, there's a number of Japanese scholars like from Japan who uh, studied Yone Noguchi. One of them is Ikko Atsumi. And she initially saw like these kinds of portraits as well as letters between Yone and Charles where Yone would call Charles dad and said that they had like a father son mentor relationship. Right? Um, if you dig through the letters though pretty carefully uh, and read it, you know, like an American would rather some rather than a queer American would rather than someone who might be, uh, you know, where English might be a learned language. You can tell almost immediately, though, that it's not a father son dad relationship. It's more of an intergenerational uh, romantic relationship between Yone and Charles. Um, the other thing that's kind of important to note is that uh, Yone was clearly a very good looking guy. Uh, when I came out with the book and used this image, um, I had a, a ton of straight women who came up to me and said, wow, Yone was a really good looking guy. It's just a little bit of gossip that might be funny or may not be. Uh, but yeah, so this is my favorite image because um, it illustrates the intergenerational affair that Yone had with Charles, right? What you can't see is the fact that he also had affairs with women. Um, he got married to uh, Alabama's first historian. Her name was Ethel Arms. Um, Ethel Arms herself was um, a person who didn't want to get married to a man, but wanted to get married uh, to women and agreed to be engaged to Yone if only she had to be married to him for one year. Um, and also, you know that uh, Yone Noguchi uh, impregnated Leonie Gilmore, and then uh, the result was uh, Isamu Noguchi. Um, so just a photo that tells us so much, right? Um, and also, was one of the early things that revealed to me that Yone was having an affair with uh, Charles Warren Stoddard uh, in my research. And Stan, what's your favorite object? So before I show you the image, I want to give a heads up to those of you who are watching this. If you uh, have younger kids with you who are watching it, you may want to shield their eyes because the next image is going to be a little racy. It's not obscene, but it's a little gay. <laughs> So with that heads up, let me share the image with you. Oops, yikes. Oh, yikes, where are we going? Oh, sorry. Yeah, there it is, okay. Um, so this is a postcard that Tina Takemoto found in the Jiro Onuma collection at the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco. And I find this image kind of hilarious and also fascinating. Um, first of all, I think it's really interesting that this type of 
um, novelty. Would it, so it's just a postcard and the, the penis is actually detachable and the penis can be used as a tightrope. So it's just really fascinating to me that this kind of novelty would exist in the early 20th century. And I'm assuming that it was for a gay male market because I can't imagine women having access to even buy something like this. And why would straight men be interested in owning this type <laughs> of object, right? So that there was like a market for gay, you know, kitschy paraphernalia like this is fascinating in and of itself. But secondly, it's really intriguing to me that an Issei man would have this among his uh, collection. Um, because, you know, as an old, as a younger Sansei, I'm at the younger end of the Sansei generation, so I still have memories of my Issei grandparents. And, you know, their memories of my grandparents and their friends as being these kind of very sweet, older people. And I know from taking Asian American studies classes that, you know, Issei, especially Issei men, in the uh, 18 or the 1890s and early part of the 20th century, you know, were pretty raucous, or a lot of them were, right? There was a lot of gambling and drinking and you know, visiting prostitutes and things like that. But you know, that history sort of fades from the, from my memory, from and replaced by the lived experience I've had with you know, my Issei grandparents. And so, just seeing this reminds me that Issei had these kind of wild lives themselves, and knowing that they were gay Issei men like Jiro. Onuma, who would collect stuff like this, is just kind of warms my heart to know that, you know, that there was a way for gay Issei men to kind of express their, their sexuality. So with that, we'll open it up for questions from you. And as Amy said, they're being moderated by uh, folks at JSA. So I'm going to pass the baton to Jill and see if uh, any questions have come up? Okay. And should I stop sharing my screen now or is it? Yeah, okay to... why don't you stop sharing your screen? Okay. And, um, you know, I haven't gotten too many. I do have one question from Evan Sakuma of API Quality LA asking How did the name of the exhibit, Seen and Unseen Queering JA History, come about? I'm going to let you feel that, Amy. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I can. It said the host. The host has full control. So I wasn't able to <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> so, so thank you. I hope that was Kathy that unmuted me. Um, so uh, this is actually in the, uh, when you go to the exhibit, it'll there's a little blurb about it. But Yona Noguchi actually came to the US in hopes of becoming an English language poet. Um, and his first book of poetry was called Seen, was titled Seen and Unseen, um, something like Monologues of a Homeless Snail or something like that. And it was a book of poetry that talked about his loneliness uh, in being in America, right? Um, by this time, he's already hanging out with Charles. Um, he's writing love letters to him, right? He's living on the Oakland Heights uh, with Joaquin Miller. Joaquin Miller loved Japanese boys. He loved collecting them. Um, he thought that they were super artistic and, and aesthetically inclined. Um, and so he's already living with Joaquin Miller in Oakland and writing love letters to Charles Warren Stoddard. Uh, and meanwhile, he's also kissing another JA named, uh, another Issei named Kosen Takahashi, whose uh, also picture is also in the exhibit. But seen and unseen refers not, obviously not just to Yone's experience being a Japanese immigrant, but also points likely to um, both his, his, his being seen and not seen also um, as uh, you know, having same-sex intimacies with uh, Charles, right, in this context. You know that Yone was likely ashamed um, of his relationship with Charles because in many of his publications when he goes back to Japan um, is written in Japanese is all about declarations of his heterosexuality. Whereas while he's in the US, he's actually immersed in this uh, homosocial world of bohemian culture. Um, and so I do think that um, Yone Noguchi, he's a little bit of a, um, he's a little bit of a shady guy because he had a couple of relationships that were not transparent. Um, if, if he were more honest about who he was with, with all of his partners, he, would, he might be polyamorous today. 
Um, but back in the day, he was lying to at least two of his three romantic partners. So he was definitely uh, duplicitous um, uh, and not being honest with his partners. He broke a number of hearts, but his seen and unseen is very much a lament um, around his state of being both seen and unseen in America. Um, similar to how I think many of us queers today, like we feel seen and unseen, both within the Japanese American community and outside of it. Thank you. We have a question from Madeline asking, how do we see the exhibit? So there's going to be a slide that comes up in a few minutes with the uh, websites to uh, access the exhibit. So one way is directly by going to seen and unseen, that's all one word, dot net. And then you could also visit the JSA website, which is jsa-org. And then you can click, there's a link at the top menu to the seen and unseen exhibit. And the, the full web address is in the slide that we'll show in a few minutes. And if, if, I, if I may also interject, um, it looks like Andrew, Andrew Leong sent me a little note about seen and unseen, uh, that it may have come also from Walt Whitman. Yone Noguchi was a big fan of Walt Whitman. Um, Yone Noguchi also was a confirmed plagiarizer of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so he could have very much taken it from uh, Walt Whitman as well. If, if, if someone could unmute Andrew Leong, maybe he could talk a little bit about uh, Whitman's poem, Matter and Spirit, in which the last line is wondrous interplay between the seen and unseen. Okay, can someone unmute Andrew? And Andrew, can you put your, oh, there you are. Oh, there he is. Yeah, hi, it's great to see everyone. Um, yeah, I think sun and un seen and unseen might, might come from a Walt Whitman poem. Um, there's also like uh, an essay by um, E.C. Stedman that also uses this seen unseen line and um, Yoni Noguchi, I think, um, was very interested in this kind of interplay of matter and spirit. Um, the context of the Walt Whitman line about the seen and the unseen is about kissing one's comrades and joining like the ocean air and, and the sea and all this kind of erotic imagery as well. So um, all of these are thematically related to the content of the exhibit. And Andrew, for those folks who don't know Whitman and Stedman, would you say that they were probably gay? Uh, Walt Whitman is, you know, uh, probably pretty queer, um, would celebrate a lot of same-sex eroticism. Um, although later on in life, uh, he may have disavowed sensuality. He also claimed that he had uh, multiple children through um, different women. Um, there's articles that you can read about this. Uh, Pete Coviello has one called Whitman's Children that might be interesting to look at. Um, so uh, one of the things that's interesting to think about is how um, same-sex sexualities in the mid 19th century to late 19th century may have manifested differently or um, resulted in different terminology than the ones that we're more familiar with in the early 21st century. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I have one question here from Alexa, who's an Asian American studies student at Northwestern. Thanks for joining us, Alexa. Um, her question is, can you speak more about the social construction of Issei beliefs during this period of time? Sure, do you want me to take that, Stan? Yeah, and actually Andrew may have something to share about that as well. Sure, sure. Um, so basically Issei, uh, and this is also just highlighted very briefly in the exhibit, um, but a Japanese culture in Japan had a long tradition of same-sex sexuality among men. Uh, dating back to the Edo period. Um, and uh, Greg Flugfelder, who's a historian, writes about this quite extensively. Um, it was typically between someone of the noble class um, and then sort of a young, beautiful, uh, they, they would call them boys, but they were young men typically. Um, and so there, there is a, an acceptability that, that, uh, that, that is part of the Japanese culture, a legacy of same-sex sexuality that was acceptable um, and in fact, what you see is that um, during the Meiji era, as 
uh, Japan increasingly is trying to become more Western and more modern, they begin to adopt American notions of morality, right? Both in terms of gender as well as sexuality. And so one of the things that um, historians talk about is that before uh, the onsen or the, the furo, the public baths were co-ed, um, but with Japan's uh, efforts to become more modern, they made them sex segregated because uh, it freaked out Americans to think of men and women bathing naked together. Um, and so in that way, uh, views about same-sex sexuality as well as uh, transgenderism, right, have shifted across time. Um, and if you're a student at UCLA, you probably already know what that means in terms of being socially constructed, right? So it's people's belief systems, what newspapers are saying, all the things around think that are floating in society shape the way we think about gender and sexuality. Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Um, sure, I, I can add something. Am, am I unmuted and visible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, to maybe extend what Amy is saying about social construction, it's also helpful to think of um, concepts like ise or nise as themselves social constructions. So the idea that um, Japanese immigrants are going to produce a second generation through heterosexual reproduction and, and have nise is an idea that it has to be developed and propagated by intellectuals or by newspapers. And one thing that uh, along with Amy, I was surprised at by looking at um, all of these digitized newspapers was that the terms Ise and Nise don't start appearing until really late in historical terms, like 1917 to 1924 to 1925. So um, part of this is also to think about how uh, Ise or concepts of um, what we would call like normative marriage and settling down and farm families are themselves a response to white racism that suggests that um, Japanese immigrants are unassimilable, that they are, um, they congregate among other men, that they sleep with prostitutes, that they gamble too much. And so part of the um, construction of Ise identity is to say, no, um, Japanese Americans are good, God-fearing um, members of American society that will have Nisei, Sansei, et cetera, and not just come over to the United States, party, sleep with prostitutes, sleep with each other, and then leave. Um, and so that, that construction, which we now live with to the extent that like, even when talking about people who came before 1917, we use this like later word, Issei, to talk back about um, people who, if you were to go up to Yonenoguchi in 1890 and say, you're an Issei, he would like probably think that you were sneezing or something. I mean, it, it, like those words didn't exist and weren't used in the same way back then. Thank you for that. I'm gonna leave Andrew up there because we have a question from Ariel asking, uh, my grandma is watching, is, is someone able to state the name of the exhibit and what it's about in Japanese? Kind of a short summary. <laughs> or Amy can take that. Andrew's PhD is way more uh, Japanese language centric than mine. Oh man. Um, seen and unseen to wa uh, mieru mienai to you yona dying desu ga sore ga ma mukashi no queer to dose ai to nan shoku to ka so yu yona koto o setsume suru exhibit desu. <laughs> Thank you. And I just want to jump in now because Donna Ozawa has a question that sort of relates to what Andrew and Amy were just talking about. And that is, do we have any reflections or comments about the intersection of racism and white supremacy and toxic max masculinity and how they impact Japanese cultural acceptance or rejection of sexual diversity? So again, I'm going to defer to to both of you, Amy and um, Andrew. Do you want to give a shot, Stan, at all, or? Um, I will after you do. Okay, all right, got it. And, and Stan, so, could you repeat the question? I, I'm not sure I caught. Sure. So do we have reflections or comments about the intersection of racism slash white supremacy and toxic masculinity? 
and how they impact Japanese cultural acceptance slash rejection of sexual diversity. So I, I just want to also give a shout out to Andrew. Andrew actually has a program later um, that's connected to this exhibit. So I do want you folks to go look for him there, as does uh, Tina Takemoto too. So just keep your eyes peeled. Um, and Tina's exhibit, if you like the tie clip penis thing, um, that's also a, a place where you might want to uh, come to the exhibit with Tina as well. Um, so just to answer the question directly, I think all of us, um, all of us folks who work on JA sexualities would say that it's very much connected to racism, right? Um, and, and toxic masculinity, uh, to be very frank. Um, I very much believe that um, Japan's embrace of nanshoku, nanshoku in the Edo period, right, was not necessarily about sort of this progressive embrace of same sex sexuality, but it was actually a tolerance for men's sexuality to basically do anything that they wanted, right? So in a patriarchal society, um, basically men can do whatever they want um, sexually, whereas women are more restricted in terms of their sexual freedoms. And so that's for me how I read uh, the, the Japanese uh, historical acceptance of male same-sex sexuality uh, during this, this time period. Um, at the same time, if you look at uh, the Japanese press, this is in Japan, things like Yomiuri Shimbun, there's actually a number of Japanese women, young women who are, kill, who are committing suicide because they're in love with each other and they're not able to uh, be able to you know, fulfill that love. Um, and you'll see an article um, from the Japanese American press that talks about a suicide activist who is focused on, on saving um, this increasing number of Japanese women who are calling themselves lesbians and, and killing themselves. Uh, I think also we, we, you know, Andrew's talked about this as well um, in his work um, and I'll let him speak to it, but I think that respectability politics, which is something that is uh, the, the language of respectability politics came out of um, African-American studies where people, where people in an effort to appear respectable in a racist society had to then conduct themselves uh, in a specific way and also negate uh, and deny uh, alternative discourses that didn't fit into the morality of mainstream society. And with that, I, I kick it to you, Andrew. Yeah, I'm thinking of a really good example in, in um, your work about Yoni Noguchi and his really fascist turn uh, after the um, Japanese victory in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. So while he's in the United States, he cultivates a kind of personality of an ideal man of the late 19th and early 20th century, combining attributes of erotic femininity uh, and culture, artistry with um, you know, uh, masculine gender as well. And um, after 1905, he collaborates with Joaquin Miller, a uh, poet who he worked with in the Heights in Oakland to write a book called Japan of Sword and Love. And some of the lyrics read as like naked pro propaganda, naked not in like the erotic nude sense, but like <laughs> directly like, um, and they have lines like, uh, and I can't quote directly from, from memory, but um, that counterpose this idea of like, Japanese is like a, a, the culture of a fairy, brownie, small uh, men that have like successfully donned imperialist masculine roles of killing uh, Russians with their swords and joining the great nations of the world. Um, and so it's, um, to reinforce Amy's point, like shifting with the fashions of what um, happens to be uh, respected masculinity at any given time can have really um, toxic and dangerous consequences. So that um, in 1905, before the United States and Japan became enemies, um, some of the imagination of a book like Japan of Sword and Love is, oh, both Japan and the United States are proving their masculine virility by defeating weaker or more degenerate nations. And the only thing I'd add to that builds on what Amy said about you know, the kind of politics of respectability. And just to you know, remind everybody that you know, majority of Japanese Americans um, in the 40s were incarcerated, right? And that had repercussions and ripple effects you know, throughout the generations, including you know, the kind of Nisei tendency to want to super assimilate and to prove their Americanness. And you know, the war, the end of World War II also coincided with the beginning of the Cold War when homosexuality was 
I was um, it was persecuted as something as evil as communism, right? So you know, Nisei and Samsansei were coming of age, you know, in this context as well, which I think uh, relates to the, the question. And I also want to point out that Greg Robinson, who's also on this call, um, mentions uh, uh, an article that he uncovered. I can't remember if it was at the 20s or the 30s, but it was of uh, Hapa, uh, Japanese-American, Mexican-American woman who was arrested in San Francisco for vagrancy, which was during that time code for either prostitution or homosexuality. Um, but the writer, who I believe was Larry Tajiri, who was a well-known Nisei journalist, speculated that uh, the woman was arrested uh, because of her skin color. Um, so reflecting uh, potentially racism uh, in that case. So Jill or Kathy, any other questions before we- Yeah, so there's a question from Patricia Wakita. Um, it kind of follows what Amy was saying. What about Issei and Nisei women? So curious if lesbian JAs were documented in any of these early literary sources or newspapers or archives. It's hard to imagine how the women could get away from the home at all to have a relationship out of the home. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so there's a, a couple of sort of, I don't wanna call them problems, but there's a couple of uh, sort of um, things that make it hard to record just women's history generally. One is that um, women didn't have access to, to forms of education that would allow them and also to wealth that would allow them to necessarily write love let pages and pages of love letters and then save them in an archive because they thought that they were important enough that their materials should be saved, right? That's one part of it. Um, so gen generally um, women's history, lesbian history in general is particularly hard to, to find. Um, also uh, sodomy was actually considered a, a crime uh, in many states, um, whereas uh, sort of oral sex between women was not necessarily considered a crime. So even in the criminal court records, we more easily find what one might imagine as gay sex versus sort of what one, what, what one would say would be um, lesbian sex. With that said, we do have a, a few records of folks who are uh, unconventionally women. Um, Tina Takemoto uh, discovered one in particular of Isa Shimoda um, who went into camp uh, recorded as female and when uh, Shimoda left camp was recorded as male. Uh, we have those documents also on the website. It doesn't necessarily mean that Shimoda was trans identified, but more points to how uh, Shimoda conduct conducted themselves in a way that may have been legible as male as well as female. Um, I, I don't know if, if Tina would like to say anything else on Shimoda. Tina Takemoto, I think is in the house. I think Kathy, you might have to unmute them. Oh, I, th I think, t I think uh, Tina may not be available. My apologies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, um, but it's true. It's it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult historical nugget uh, to sort of unravel. Um, with Yone Noguchi, because he actually did have affairs with at least one woman who would, uh, in the contemporary period, be seen as a lesbian. We have records of uh, Yone Noguchi getting engaged to one, at least one, uh, quote white uh, lesbian. And I say lesbian in quotes because at the time, Ethel Arms did not identify as a lesbian, uh, but she did say very uh, explicitly that she'd rather be with women than with men. I have a question, or a, yeah, a question from Wayne Itogao, Itoga. Was the older guy supposed to give up the younger, beautiful guy at a certain age, like the Hellenistic Greek mentor mentee thing? <laughs> and if he, didn't, was that a social, social bad thing? Yeah, so I don't, I mean, I don't know if someone here is, is better at uh, nanshoku, nanshoku, but my understanding from reading, reading Greg Flugfelder's book, and maybe Andrew, you can help out with this, um, is that uh, you don't, if once you, be, once you become an older guy, you always have a younger guy. 
Um, uh, and as the younger guy gets older, then you would usually get a, another younger guy. Um, uh, and I, I think that there may have been, um, this is, if we were talking 1600s Japan, that's what I'm un understanding the, the question to be about, uh, which I'm less familiar with, but that's my understanding of what uh, Greg Flugfelder found. Um, yeah, so um, maybe for those that are interested, Greg Flugfelder's book is called Cartographies of Desire um, and is worth checking out if you're interested in these things. Um, one thing also to mention as a kind of big caveat here is that um, when talking about nanshoku or danshoku, a lot of what we get is like the equivalent of what it would be like if you're if you were reading say like the advocate or out or like whatever like grinder profiles or, or like to shift generations it's like what people wrote about nanshoku and danshoku and like what people actually did might be quite different so like normatively there might have been prescriptions about um you should be this age and that the person younger um, should uh, still have their forelocks and not have gone through a coming of age ceremony. Um, normatively, the um, person with the forelocks should be age younger than the other uh, older person who's in the active or penetrative role. But you know, there are also records of people violating even those conventions that are associated with um, what should be. And often um, these are kind of material for comic effect so that when like a young Lord sleeps with an actor that he presumes to be uh, a younger and therefore um, available receptive, uh, receptive partner and then discovers to his horror that the um, person is like 10 years older, that's like a, a cause for um, you know, comedy with, within that. And so one thing to think about here is that um, what is prescribed or what's noted in the documentary record might be different from how people uh, live their lives in the same way that, you know, 200 to 300 years from now, you would not want people to go back through chat records or like um, personal profiles in order to like determine what act like what what people are actually doing in um, bedrooms, right? It might establish a good idea of a kind of discourse of what people express as their desires and how those are, are shaped. But to get like at what really is going on might require a little bit more um, interpretive work. Thanks, that was enlightening for me. Uh, Jill and Kathy, any more questions? Um, I don't have any here, Kathy. Um, nope. <laughs> So we're going to wrap up then. I'm going to share my screen one more time. So as we know, it's going to take a little while for it to appear on your screen. Oops. OK. Can you see my screen now? Yes. OK. So Amy alluded to these programs and we hope that you will join us and continue this, this conversation and this learning. So the first program is gonna be November 8th with Amy uh, talking about Yone Noguchi specifically and it's queer compulsions, love, sex and scandal in turn of the century Japanese America. And then Andrew is gonna follow up on November 17th with his presentation called We're Here. We Were Here and Queer Before the Issei. And then Tina Takamoto is going to screen two um, short films that were inspired by uh, queer Issei and uh, we'll have a discussion with her. So please join us for those programs. You can visit the JSA website um, or the exhibit website to uh, register for those programs. And then just in closing, I wanna give another shout out to all of our fantastic community partners, because as Kay said, you know, we could have created the best exhibit in the world, but without an audience, it would really be for naught. So we really appreciate our community partners for spreading the word about this exhibit um, and the programs that are related to it. And we hope that, you know, those of you who are participating in this launch event will do so as well. And I wanna do a final shout out to our funder, uh, California Humanities. Uh, because without them, you know, I would have been writing checks to my own personal checking account, you know, to pay for the production of this exhibit. So I'm 
grateful that California Humanities uh, has supported it. And then finally, I'm gonna, uh, oh, here, here's the website or websites that you can access the exhibit through. So seenandunseen.net and then through JSA, jsa.org slash seen dash and dash unseen. So please visit the exhibit as many times as you'd like. At the very bottom of the exhibit, there's a way for you to provide feedback and we really encourage you to do that. It's just like a one page form. It'll take you a couple of minutes to fill out. Uh, the folks at California Humanities would appreciate that, that data.